Aloha. This is Think Tech Hawaii's show, the state of the state of Hawaii. Welcome to you uh, in the viewing audience, and thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our topic today is uh, serious, and, I, uh, and it's about Hawaii safety and solvency. And given the impending COVID COVID nineteen lockdown, we're likely to have, and the unrelenting economic distress across all sectors that we're all facing in one way or another. Um, I think we all have questions about what leadership is enacting and, and what it needs to enact. So we'll talk about um, our current leaders um, and with knowledgeable guests to uh, illuminate us uh, in this conversation. And knowing that we have new leadership uh, soon and uh, shortly to come to Honolulu Holly and to the White House. So now we know the cast of the leaders and who would be leaders possibly. And so we need to think about and, and express uh, views on how do we select leaders? We still have some voting to do. Um, and we need to know how we select leaders we know can make um, Hawaii safe and solvent again. So I'm um, pleased to welcome two guests today uh, to, to comment on Hawaii's conditions, learning opportunities in the crisis, and our prospects for recovery and hopefully returning to norm. But um, both of them know a lot about Hawaii and have worked here for a very long time. And they work and think and write about Hawaii's issues and and are knowledgeable about the community's needs. So I welcome to the show, uh, Reverend uh, David Gerlach. He's the rector at St. Elizabeth's Episcopal Church in Palama. And he tirelessly works for the benefit of Hawaii's neediest communities like uh, the homeless uh, prison population and Pacific Islanders and, and so on. So welcome, Father David. So glad you could come. And Dr. Neil Milner is here too. He's Emeritus UH Professor of Political Science and a political commentator and writer. And I think you can see him often in Civil Beat. So welcome to you, Dr. Neil Milner. Thank you. Glad you both could come. Well, on this topic, um, I wanted to just express one uh, a view of what might be happening here in Hawaii uh, over this, the course of this experience. And uh, my question is, um, do you think Hawaii and its leadership understand that Hawaii is as vulnerable to a global crisis as any other nation on the planet is? So my, my question is really about, has Hawaii's leadership been arrogant? about what it takes to keep Hawaii safe? Is there something about the ocean around us that's gonna make us saved? So maybe your comments on that and related to that would help us understand how this has come to be so serious. Well, I can start. I don't think arrogance Thanks. is the problem. Um, I mean, we, the, uh, there's, you, you, the, frankly, whether you're arrogant or not arrogant, the pandemic was going to get here. And in fact, maybe the one good thing we did, partially out of luck, was to isolate ourselves as much as possible by cutting off the tourist industry earlier, early on. I think everything we've done after that gets a D. Um, and it's not about arrogance. It's about a kind of a sense of inco a, a, a basically incompetence and not telling people the truth about how we were building a capacity to deal with this at the next level when things would get more serious. And so that's what I've been more concerned about. You caught me at a good time because I have a, a column in Civil Beat tomorrow about that. But, you know. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Uh, did they have a plan? Are you saying that there was a plan? They just didn't tell us about it at the quote next level? I don't think there was a plan. I don't think there's a, I mean, here's the evidence that I would go by. There, and, and this is not all the fault of the planners, it's the fault of the resources available. 
we still don't know how to bring back tourists. And uh, uh, I don't think we're any closer to that than we were a few months ago. That's one thing. The second thing, and to me much more scandalously, is it turns out that when it comes to um, testing, when it comes to contract, contact tra uh, uh, testing, uh, contact tracing, excuse me, we got nothing, basically. It's, it's been a kind of Potemkin village that the Department of Health was claiming we had and that we didn't need anymore. And all of a sudden that turns out not to be true. So moving to the next level, which is a level we're at now, which is where there's been a spike. I don't think that we have the, we don't have the leadership capacity that has demonstrated that they can handle what is now happening. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that I very much agree with Neil's analysis of this. Um, just today, I was talking with Josie Howard, who's the uh, CEO of We Are Oceania. They are one of the one-stop drop-in places for folks from the Marshalls and Micronesia to get help on all kinds of things. And one of the things they've been working very hard on is trying to get their population tested. Uh, because as we know, among that population, this disease is running rampant, primarily because of poverty. People live too close to each other, too many in a home. And, and even culturally, it's very, very difficult for folks not to gather. And they've been turned away for testing. Um, so just today, we're trying to set up a situation where we can uh, have a drive-through testing at St. Elizabeth's for free for that population. But why is this happening in August? Uh, this should have been happening in, in at least April and May. And, and the other side of that is, in terms of our education, we're talking about schools opening up. I've got grandchildren who are going into preschool and elementary school, older kids uh, at the university level. It is uh, astounding to me the lack of preparation that's happened. Uh, the superintendent of schools was on NPR last week and people were calling in about ideas and suggestions like we've air conditioned all of our schools. How are we gonna have the free flow of air with air conditioned rooms? And we've sealed up windows. And instead of hearing a response that said, well, yes, and we considered that back in March and this is the, what we're going to do. The response was, well, that's a really good point. We'll have to think about that. Yeah, there's been a lot of criticism of the governor and other leadership for the COVID-19 spread even and the and certainly the health department's contact tracing fiasco that we've had going on before we even knew it and uh and the needy community's uh vulnerability i mean it's not like we didn't know these things so i mean the question is do they deserve criticism for this just somewhat they deserve to lose their jobs actually that's my opinion you can't the governor can't lose it as easily as, as anybody else can, that there that the the example of contact tracing and, and here's one other point I want to make. I I've been thinking about this a lot and I no longer view this as an exceptional example of government ineptitude. It's very much indicative of the way state government generally operates around here. The lack of transparency, the bad planning, all of those things are essentially part of the state institutional political culture. And we are so used to that, that we just assume that that's how things are gonna go, but this is gonna be different and things are gonna be turned around. I'm just astonished at how much people here are behaving leadership the way they usually behave in a kind of mediocre manner. This has greater consequences because, well, for obvious reasons, but that's, what, that's another frightening thing. And later on, if you wanna talk about how we recover from that, that becomes a factor that's very much a part of it. Well, yes, we I'll, I'll, say that. We, we wanna cover that, yes. Father David, were you gonna say something? Well, I, I would like to say that the one bright spot, I think, in our state government's response to all of this has frankly been in our judiciary. Uh, they have been exceptional in getting out clear information to people that when there is a spike in cases, courts are shut down immediately and alternate arrangements are made so that the business of the courts can be done. But they have been from day one, uh, from the chief justice on down, made sure that people are understanding what the situation is and they have operated in a way that has been truly exceptional and in a way that I wish they would be 
talking to the governor and some of these other department heads to say, here is a template you can follow to, uh, to not only inform, but to safeguard. Well, I think that uh, we had a little uh, preamble to this or, pre or premonition or remember when the rocket from, from, <laughs> from Korea was supposed to be here? I don't mean to chuckle at all. It was horrifying. But remember, there was absolutely no preparation at all either. And the, um, when they went to try and blow any sirens or anything, the system that was set up for that kind of warning was, had not been touched since like 1943 or something like that after the attack. So, I mean, we already had this huge warning about how um, unattentive, inattentive the government is to, to uh, really important issues of, about things that, you know, aren't ever supposed to happen, but they happen. And so, um, so if you it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that really- example, I think a better example was the 30 meter telescope. We heard all kinds of things about how that was going to be handled, hypothetically, right? And all it took was people uh, protesting and occupying a strategic place, and every, every everything fell apart. This is not about whether you're for a telescope or against the telescope. My own feeling was over time, I came increasingly against it because I could see how badly it was being handled. But it turned out that the governor had nothing. That all of the promises that had been made, all of the people who had supported it had nothing. All of the promises that they had made to the public, about, or they talked about the majority of the people wanted, it turns out there was nothing there. And if anybody thought that there wasn't going to be a protest, and if anybody couldn't figure out if, that if you protest in a strategic place, that you're going to have, you're going to, have to make some very important decisions about what you do there, they, they were naive. And it turns out that a lot of people were naive. Well, naivety is not a qualification for these leadership positions. So I, um, I wanted to ask uh, you, Father David, and you may have something to say after Neil has just said that, but I mean, I want to ask, will the new leadership we have chosen at Hon for, for Honolulu Holly, for the mayor, are they going to be better at finding ways or preparing ways and yeah. resources to avoid and solve problems? That's our uh, citizen question, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna back into that by just mentioning one other thing though. I mean, yes, the, we have the nuclear missile test was a fiasco, yes. TMT is a fiasco, but the fact that a pandemic is something that was expected uh, and mm -hmm. the fact that we haven't prepared for it. You know, I, I say January or March, we should have been moving, but the fact is our Department of Health should have had a plan in place for years because this is something we've known was coming. It's happened before. We've been very lucky that it's had a relatively min minimal impact in the past ones, but we knew something bad was coming. So it, it's frankly just inexcusable because that's what we trust government to do is to have the foresight and the uh, technical ability to protect the people that they're serving. And this has really been a Keystone's Cops operation. Well, I think in addition to that, Bill Gates uh, was talking about this a long while ago and a couple years ago. And I was looking at, uh, there's one of these uh, pharmaceuticals that's prepping up a vaccine. And they're, they were donated to by the Gates like two years ago. I think it was 2015. So that was when they had this huge load of money to, to make it happen. And that was long before there was, uh, I shouldn't say that there was no sign because people have been predicting this, those who have been in the know. And I think that kind of gets back to the arrogance, you know, that these people are just so arrogant and they're on such airheads and they're out there with the ideas and we've got to get on with, you know, the business of governing. But this is the business of governing is to keep people safe and from dying unnecessarily, which is what we don't have now. Yeah, so I, what about the new leadership that we're gonna have coming on? Do you guys um, see that we've made choices that are, in, are perhaps suggestive of an appreciation of skill that these people are gonna have? I mean, like in our mayor, we're now down to two people who have no government experience. So is that gonna lead us into some other competence that will, will have a better effect on, on, uh, on Hawaii's uh, health and that can, work, that can work both ways. I mean, I'd start by saying at best, it's a work in progress. There's simply no way 
to evaluate these two these two candidates with any kind of extreme confidence because they're so new to the process and because the, the, the problem is such an evolving problem. Um, the job is changing because of, pan of pandemic. Uh, but I think that, um, I, I think that the other thing that both candidates have to be careful of, um, it's an advantage being an outsider, but it's also a disadvantage is that you're going into the same kind of organizational culture that has existed here for forever, basically. And so you have to, if you want to be a change agent, you have to be able to do that. And it's, it's, it's very hard. I think the nature of the job, one of the things that's happening with big city mayors whose importance has been increasingly underemphasized because people have become more interested in national politics. But one of the things that's happening is that mayors are starting to make contact with other mayors around the world to share information on how the heck you deal with the pandemic. What's your city doing? What's, and and that's, a, that's a kind of a different job than it was before. So it's not just the fiscal challenges. It's the nature of the work. And it's the nature of being able to talk to people in ways that can be candid with them and that can reassure them, which our governor is not very good at. Our mayor, Mayor Caldwell, is better at it. I wouldn't rate him as high as some of the other mayors elsewhere in the, in the state, but he's he, he's okay. So that's the that's the hedge answer. The, the, because everything is changing so fast, who knows how good they're going to be? Right. Yeah, Father David, what do you think about that? I mean, we've got essentially two guys with business backgrounds, and you know, I guess the the cheap shot would be is that we've tried a guy with a business background, but. That's really not fair to people with a business background. Um, I know both of them. I, I, my own sense is that uh, either of them will probably be a fine mayor. I know they're both real smart and I know they're both uh, very linked into a lot of places in the community where they can get help. And my sense is, is that no matter which one is elected, they will uh, be sure to do that. I, I was kind of happy to see that we didn't get a rerun of, a, of an old timer um, uh, and we shall see. I, I don't know that it can get much worse. I mean, I agree Mayor Caldwell has done a, a, a pretty good job, um, but we shall see. All right. Well, I did see something, I think it was in Civil Beat about how all of those experienced ones were candidates were tainted by rail and oh. um, in one way or another. Is that- So unfair. <laughs> Is that fair? Oh, are you smirking? Uh, or is, yes. is that something that makes sense to you, Father yes, David? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, it makes sense. Um, you know, Mayor Hanneman started this. Um, the other, most of you know, Kim Pine was on the council right along. Um, Colleen sat on the board, so they're all kind of very intimately connected with it, some more than others, and it has been a boon to our construction industry. It's probably something that's too bad we didn't do during the 90s when we were in that deep funk, but it's really been an economic disaster from just about every point of view. Well, um, it seems like it is a very big chunk for Honolulu to have taken on and, and evidently they took on the hard part of it. To, to do instead of starting with an easy part. But, um, but on the other hand, having uh, a Washington DC experience in the horror show of the seventies while they were, they were jackhammering you know, down all the streets to get that Metro in, Honolulu has not had a chance to have the experience of what it means to have this kind of uh, a facility here. Uh, the Metro went underground partly and that makes it harder, but we haven't had the, the, the section that we've done is a walk in the park compared to the section that they have to finish, both technologically and politically. Uh, technologically, because you got a whole lot of stuff that you have to figure out how to do with relocation and so on. Politically, because you're, you're um, interrupting the lives of a lot more people, including people who drive down Tillingham Boulevard. So, I, I mean, that's going to be, well, if we get the money, uh, that's it's still going to be uh, very, very hard. Well, you're supposed to get the money. I mean, the f federal government is mostly paying for it, isn't it? It's a matter of managing it. Well, they haven't given us the money yet. I mean, that this the good the good news money wise is that they're in the business. The feds on this, they're in the business of giving this money away. This is not about them 
trying to hold back on the money. It's about using it to build public transportation. The bad news is that they quite rightly have refused actually to release that huge amount of money because uh, we, until they see that the plan is in operation. And it took the state, it took the city and county and heart forever to develop a plan that got provisional approval. It was like, I didn't do my homework and then I did my homework and okay, you're approved provisionally. But they have not actually written the check. Um, and I think they're waiting to see how this next stage is going to be financed, the one that we're supposed to hear about uh, very soon. Okay. Well, I think that uh, your description of the expansion of the mayor's uh, uh, responsibilities and duties is it really interesting because it kind of it relates to one of the questions I was going to ask, which is, is government supposed to be able to do all this? I mean, what is it that the government can or cannot do it? In other words, what you all do uh, in bringing away the community's awareness up and doing this, you know, like what you're doing for tomorrow in the media and getting people to understand what's happening. And then Father David with this, uh, you know, and his work with um, all of his special needs communities and, and other responsibilities that are contributing to Hawaii Honolulu. But maybe something else has to happen in the way of these businessmen coming on and knowing they can't have the expertise and the deep uh, insights that you all do, that they'll put something together. I think one of them has a committee of expert citizens or something like that to advise him. Because um, without, um, the information coming into them, we kind of get in the situation we are in nationally, right? We've got somebody that's not take, there's no input. It's just output. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty well known that uh, there's not much um, advice and resource that can get through or that's desired and therefore things are happening uh, in ways that are not informed or according to advisors. But maybe that's something that we have to think about that we're expecting too much of government. Are we expecting too much of government? Well, that's the old liberal conservative argument. I'll, I'll, let me talk about it in a personal standpoint. Although I'm pretty, pretty far to the left on a lot of these kinds of questions, I'm fairly conservative. I don't I don't believe, I'm always skeptical about um, big general plans or blue ribbon commissions that experts develop. Or when I see the word transformation, I begin to worry because they tend to look too far into the future without thinking about the mechanisms that you did. And I think a lot of people, and I think you're starting to see that with the people's response to how we recover from, from this. So, but, you know, this is not, I don't want to dignify the state's response here by saying it, we need something all that new. I mean, there are changes you can make primarily in the political culture, actually. But this is, I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to give people information. You have to keep them safe. You, you, know, you, you have to follow up with certain things and you have to be, whatever it means, some kind of fiscal responsibility. You have to know the kinds of resources you need and, and so on. So I don't even want to talk about th th this kind of state. If, if the two mayoral candidates want to set up uh, comm committees of experts, that's fine. You get some good ideas. I spent my life working with committees of experts. They're called faculty departments. It has its good side and it has its bad side. But that's good. But that really doesn't, I don't want to dignify the, the kind of basics or, of politics by thinking that it has to operate out at that level. You need honesty, you need a certain kind of sets of limits on, on what you can do, and there's basic things that you have to do. Um, and, and there yeah, has one to of the things, yeah. go ahead. One of the things that we just seem to lack here locally in, in too many offices, starting with the governor, is a lack of imagination. Um, and just a, and a lack of a willingness to take a stand without uh, worrying things to death. Um, that's what's been so troubling. And I think that's why we're in this mess that we're in. I, I don't understand why we weren't putting bracelets on people getting off of our planes. And if we saw them on a beach, they get arrested. 
and they don't get their and they'd have to put a thousand dollar deposit down when they get their bracelet you know and in 14 days they can show up and get that refunded um you know there's just all these kinds of simple ideas that we could have used to help keep track of folks who are coming here from the mainland who are probably the initial spreaders and also why did we go from zero to 90 with respect to opening and then closing our parks when people began to congregate uh impermissibly why not institute months ago with hpd just instituted which was roving bands of cops to go break up these groups and arrest people and cite people. Why did that just start in July? Why didn't that start in March? Um, these are the kinds of things that I don't understand why our government leadership isn't seeing and putting into action. It's not rocket science. And not only isn't it rocket science, but it's, it's the nuts and bolts, particularly of city government. One of the hard things about being a mayor is that you can't always talk about being judged in terms of um, abstractions. Is, is the garbage collected? Did they set up a, a decent system for picking up the big, the big items? Are the cops behaving in a certain kind of way? And here was one like that. I think it was partly a lack of political will that they, and, and partly a kind of sympathy, right? Uh, these people are back out there. But yeah, I had the same experience driving through Waikiki the last few weeks. Um, you had big gatherings on the beach uh, of, of people, um, look like family gatherings. We're not talking about rock concerts here. Well, but I mean, it is, they, they, they add up. Uh, and so I had the same experience going over to Wamanello all the way over uh, around the Diamond Head was it, was, it was just mobbed early in the morning. Everybody was out, no masks or anything. That was two weeks ago. But I think that what I'm, what what next question is uh, has to do with uh, the the cost. Okay, so what whatever um, you do anywhere is expensive. So um, we know that the state's uh, credit rating has been downgraded by Moody's um, Investor Service. It's gone from it's been downgraded already from stable to negative. So the impact on our um, economic our economy is undeniable at every level, as uh, I said in the beginning, across uh, every sector. But um, these um, efforts are expensive to, to you know, uh, operate. I mean, the roving bands of cops through Waikiki, they're supposed to, you know, rove through all our parks and they're supposed to be monitoring for all of this. I mean, I like Father David's idea about the bracelets and, you know, and, and all of us, promising to give people stink eye if they don't have their mask on. I mean, we need we need all of that kind of thing. But but what we're not seeing deployed are, of course, the expensive things. That's my I surmise that they didn't do that because it was so expensive. So I I have the question about um, the resources that can be brought to make this happen. And I keep wanting to know why the, as I've mentioned before, I think to you, Dr. Milner, the golden goose of Waikiki, those hotels are not putting some money in the piggy bank here because they are also enacting um, the roles that they need to have there. I mean, they, they need to be monitoring any quarantined people and they need to be the ones to keeping them inside and making sure that, that they're not breaking uh, the law. I mean, so what? What? What are our resources? Given that we're, we're. Um, I know there's lots of federal money from the acts that have already been passed that's come into the state. I don't know how that's being deployed, but we do know that we're in trouble in the budgets at the state level and and also at the city and county. So what? What do you see as how we're going to manage? to get things to happen that need to be happening, uh, even common sense wise things. Well, I mean, there are two things here, the kind of resources that you need to get through the pandemic in the short run. Some of that is a money problem. Some of it is a, simply a supply chain or lack of will to get them. So we know, and, and I don't think those are huge expenses compared to what I'm gonna say next. You know, if you, if testing becomes more available, if, um, uh, you know, if we figure out a way to do more contact tracing, that's not really a big amount of money. 
The serious thing is the incredible depression that we're going to face here. Uh, the estimate I heard today was that the tourist industry would not come back any would not come back to where it was before the pandemic until 2025. And, and so much, and, and, and the fact that a lot of people are gonna be unemployed and, and the area where David and I live, which is not usually associated with economic vulnerability, you're gonna see people from East Oahu who are gonna be out of housing. They're gonna be, it's gonna be a, a new population of housing. That's, that's the serious economic problem. What a mayor faces is that there aren't many revenues. I mean, everybody faces this. You've got a significant problem. You're calling for more money from government, but it isn't like we can tap into an exist a larger uh, revenue source unless they would really raise taxes, and that raises other kind of complications. So, and that's part of what the, the leadership is going to have to be like: making hard decisions, knowing when to encourage and when when to be realistic and say you know you have to cut back. I that's that to me is really scary. Um, one other thing that's scary to me is that. We've been saying that we're a, a, a un, insufficiently diversified economy for years. And we've also been saying we haven't had enough affordable housing for years. Why do people think that all of a sudden that's going to change? I mean, the problem is worse now. Um, and, and when you try to figure out how do you get out of this, um, how do you diversify the economy? Well, I think there are ways you can do it, but this is not exactly going to happen, happen the day after tomorrow. And so the next couple of years are really going to be tough for a lot of people. Well, I noticed that you said that the tourism isn't going to come back. I mean, I did read that the economic recovery is, is certainly three to five years out. Yeah. It's a, going to be a struggle all the way there. But I didn't. I don't understand why you say the tourists are not coming back. Are they already beating down the doors to get out here? Well, I mean, not, I didn't not, think they're no, not. We're not beating down the doors to get out here. And I think, I think you can't, I think the tourists are not going to come back that quickly. And I think it's in, and so we rely on it, on, on it so much. Um, I, I understand the urge to open up tourism because it's down to basically zero, but you're not going to get that huge recovery. People aren't going to want to travel. Um, if they travel, they're not going to have money. And if they have money, that doesn't mean they're going to have the, they're, they're going to want to use it here. So I think that that's that there's going to be a demand issue for a while. And the, the, the hook that we were using is that this is the safest place on earth. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Middle of the ocean, of course. <laughs> well, but the, yeah, that's, I mean, this is not the British Empire uh, back in the day when an island nation was really, yeah, was really protected. Um, so I think that yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I really am very curious doesn't do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see what our, what our moves to recovery are going to be like. It, it, it's, 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 well, I, I think so. And I was uh, dis I was recalling that I did disagree with you while we were still rather low in our spread numbers and in our rates yeah. of infection per cases. We're up now. We're getting up there to 10% of positive uh, co co COVID um, cases in the in the testing. Now this this weekend showed us that we're really in in the dire stretch here. But before that, people did want out because they were thinking it was safer. So Father David, do you have any uh, comments on that? No, not really. You know, I, I wish the hotels were doing more to help quarantine people. I wish they were doing more to help house those who are unsheltered. I know there is some of that going on and, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but you know, these are mostly multinational corporations that have very deep pockets. And I think they could be doing a heck of a lot more than they're doing now. Well, tell me what is happening with the, and we're probably going to have to wrap up in a little bit, but um, I would like to know, uh, could you share about what they're doing for houselessness? I would really like to know if anybody's doing anything that's been in my head with those empty rooms. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that anything's really being done with houselessness per se, but I do know that folks who are testing positive who are houseless are being allowed, uh, some of the hotels are opening up to let them be in basically a quarantine situation. So IHS has some deals with some hotels to provide that service, but it's basically a, a, a relatively minor role that they're playing. 
And as Neil says, once this, you know, I feel like we're still like the coyote that just ran off the cliff chasing the roadrunner and our feet are still going wildly in the air, but we're going to fall. And when we do, I think there's going to be an awful lot of people who are hurt very, very badly. And that's the question of if, if our leadership can't even do contact tracing, if they can't even tell us the truth about how many people they've got for something like that, how on earth are we going to deal with this coming catastrophe? That's what worries me. I think that is absolutely the question. Um, do you have another comment? Well, I was just going to say, when California really first got bad, the San Francisco City Council, and I'm not sure about Los Angeles, pushed very hard to get more hotels to do what uh, David had just described here as uh, 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 and that's a very complicated venture because there's certain kind of people you can't isolate because they don't do well alone and so on. But there was the mayor and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors had big arguments because they wanted to put more into that than the mayor did. But the point is, it became a significant political issue that did a lot more about it there. And if we kick up, if our rates kick up, then um, that could be another um, more pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And it is uh, some place to go uh, with some inquiry and maybe new leadership can uh, have a fresh approach to looking at what all is already here that we could start tapping in some way. But I know it's complicated and uh, we'll see how it goes. And I appreciate both of you being here and your comments have been so informative and you all are so insightful. Thank you very much. This is the I think Tech Hawaii's uh, state of the state of Hawaii show, and I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and I'll see you again in two weeks. And uh, certainly appreciate your attention, and aloha and mahalo. <laughs>